Let's remain standing for the reading of God's word. Our text this morning is found in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 55. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in the God, my Savior, because he looked with favor upon the humble state of his servant. For behold, all generation from now on will be blessed through me, because the mighty one has done great things through me, and holy is his name. His mercies for generations and generations are to, to those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his right hand and scattered the arrogant in the thought of their hearts. He has taken down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent away the rich ones to be empty. He helped Israel, his servant, because he remembered his mercy to Abraham and to his seed from eternity, just as spoke to our fathers. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you right now for this moment to be in your presence, O oh God. And we just ask now, Lord, just to help us now to worship you, Lord, by the hearing of your most holy word. May, may you bless Pastor Joel as you deliver your message. May you give us ears to hear as we listen to what the Spirit has to say. May you give us faith and repentance as we hear these words. And for those already living in and before your presence, may their joy and gladness and pleasure in our Lord increase and thus be utterly satisfied. Blessed indeed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Amen. Indeed, Merry Christmas to each and every one. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say Merry Christmas? We celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and rightly we rejoice because in Jesus, the salvation of the world has finally come. The world in its pining and longing under the tyranny of death has uh, reached its uh, ending and its longing now satisfied in Jesus Christ because in his birth, God has fulfilled his promises and indeed he has brought about salvation to the world. Continuing our theme on Christmas joy from Luke's gospel, we have discovered two previous reasons for joy in Christmas. Number one, there is Christmas joy because God fulfills his promise with the birth of Jesus. And number two, there is Christmas joy because God displays his mercy by sending his son Jesus in the fullness of time to be born of woman, to be born under, law, uh, under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might be adopted as sons and daughters. By sending his own son at the fullness of time, God finally then fulfilled his commission to Adam, his promise to Abraham, Israel, and David, as Paul rightly exclaims in 1 Corinthians, in Christ Jesus, all of God's promises, everybody say all. all. All of God's promises are yes and amen. The glory of the incarnation in Christmas also means that God created humanity, or rather God treated humanity, not according to what we deserve, which is mercy. What we deserve, like Israel in Egypt, and like the, de the demon-possessed person in Gerasim, as we learned last Sunday, is to remain in bondage to sin and, sh and in shackles to death. Jesus' birth on Christmas Day gloriously sets humanity free from the cruel tyrant of Satan and death once and for all. By defeating sin and death, Jesus then establishes his unquestioned and perpetual kingship over the universe in fulfillment to his promise to David. This morning's focus on joy on Christmas 
is on the manner of how God defeats death and displays dominion through Jesus' birth. And that is, Jesus exercises his kingship, his dominion, as the ruler of the universe through humility. Or, as Scott Haveman likes to put it, it's dominion through dependence. Dominion through dependence. Or, to put it in the words of Mary, there is Christmas joy because God exalts the humble. Which is thus the title to this morning's sermon, Christmas joy. Why? Because in Christmas, with the birth of Jesus, he demonstrates that God indeed exalts the humble. Mary's eruption of joy couched in this song, famously called the Magnificat, spotlights or spotlights humility or dependence upon the Lord as the means through which God exalts his people. As we see in verse 46 in Mary's wonderful song, and she sang and she said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in the God my Savior. Why? In verse 46 we find out why. Because on Christmas Day, through the conception of the Virgin Mary, He looked with favor upon the humble state of His servant. And in verse 52, why? Because on Christmas Day, God exalted the humble. Why then is there joy during Christmas? Because Christmas displays that God exalts the humble. Of course, there is an ironic interplay when God exalts the humble. It is God lifting high those who are low. And God, on the other hand, humbles the haughty. Those who are high, God brings low. And those who are low, God brings high. The manner of humility as the pathway to exaltation is not new with Mary. Mary didn't make this up with her song. Indeed, this dominion by dependence upon God is apparent in the creation of the first man, Adam. Adam was supposed to rule and have dominion over creation by trusting and obeying God's word. Genesis 1, 27-28, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over every living thing. Man, because we are created in God's image, reflect the image of God by ruling, by subduing, because God is king of the universe, and we, as His image bearers then, are to rule. But the way in which we rule is critical for our understanding. We don't rule by flexing our muscles. We don't rule by showing off how smart we are. We don't rule by showing off how rich we are. Instead, we rule by trusting, relying, depending, obeying God's word. And we know this for certain because the moment Adam and Eve tried to know good and evil outside of God, instead of dependence upon God, they exercised independence from God. They foolishly attempted to know good and evil by their own devices. So they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they believed the lie that you will be God when you disobey God. You will know good and evil by yourself. As a result, Adam and Eve then were separated from God, and their separation from God brought about death because God is the fountain of life, and once we are separated from God, we begin to die. Because of Adam's futility of independence from God, death now has dominion over all mankind. Instead of us ruling, death rules over us. God then sought to restore dominion back to humanity by picking another Adam. His name was Abraham. And through Abraham, God will make another Adam kind, another humankind, 
They're called Abraham kind. They are the nation of Israel. And through the nation of Israel, God will begin to reclaim the dominion that Adam lost in the garden. Yet, as we see, Israel falls for the same trap. In their attempt to find a king for the first time over Israel, Israel resorted to the folly of dominion by independence, looking for qualities in a man that exalts man's abilities, not God's grace. So the people of Israel then famously chose King Saul. He's tall, dark, handsome, educated, well-liked. He was the consensus, the best man for the job. Because all the values that man treasure, education, wealth, physical beauty, intelligence, eloquence of speech, all these things match up exactly to Saul. The people chose Saul to be their king. Yet the Lord rejected Saul. Like Adam, Saul also failed to obey the Lord. Instead of obeying the Lord to slaughter the animals, Saul thought he knew better than God. These are precious animals. We have to think of animals as resources. A lamb is like a Tesla. A cow is like a house. And when the Lord told Saul to destroy all the animals, Saul said, no, Lord, that's a waste. As if Saul knew better than the Lord. And so when the prophet Samuel came to confront Saul, Samuel heard the sound of animals bleeping, mooing. And Samuel asked, what are the sounds of these animals that I hear? Saul said, oh yeah, about that. I saved them so that what? I can sacrifice them unto the Lord. I can make a sacrifice unto God. And Samuel then rebuked Saul with the most stinging words in Scripture. Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than you making a sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord's not pleased with that. The Lord cares about your heart, obeying, relying upon Him. So the Lord then rejected Saul. In contradistinction from the people's choice came God's choice. The runt, the youngest among his siblings, a poor shepherd boy playing by himself all the day long with the sheep. His name is David. The exact same verb in Mary's song, he looked with favor, is also found in 1 Samuel when the Lord looked with favor upon David. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, Lord, do not look, on the, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance, on the posture of his size, because I have rejected him. For God will not look as a mortal will see, for a mortal will see into a face. But God will look with favor, the exact same verb, into a heart. We all know the story. While Saul was still king, God engineered a coup d'etat. He told Samuel, go to Jesse's household, and one of his sons is my choice for the king of Israel. So Samuel obeys. Very dangerous, right? This is a coup d'etat. You're threatening the king. He goes to Jesse's house, says, the, the Lord sent me here to anoint the next king of Israel. 
He said, really? Bring out your sons. The first son, buff, strong. The Lord said, nope, not him. Next. Oh, this one's impressive, Lord. Look at him. The Lord said, nope, next. All the sons go down. They called him from the battlefield because they're all soldiers. Each one, the Lord said, no, 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 no. And finally, Samuel asked, is there anyone else? Because I don't think the Lord made a mistake. He sent me here. And Jesse, the dad, said, well, I have this young kid, but you won't like him. He's a runt, skinny, plays in the field all day, plays his harp. Bring him here. As soon as David came, the Lord told Samuel, that's him. That's him. This shepherd boy, maybe 12 years old, he will rule over Israel. God chooses the lowly and the humble to have dominion, to reign. It is dominion by dependence, trusting, relying upon the Lord. So what God has done for David, he also did for Mary many centuries later. God chose a lowly virgin in Mary to highly exalt her. In contrast, then, God humbles the haughty, which Mary also sings with beauty and grace in verse 51. He has done a mighty deed with this right hand, and scatter the arrogant in the thought of their hearts. He has taken down the mighty from the thrones and exalted the humble. Mary, in singing the humbling of the haughty, echoes the Old Testament tradition of dominion by dependence, which is perhaps best captured in the enthronement psalm in Psalm chapter 2, a critical psalm for us to understand who Jesus is often quoted in the New Testament and repeated all throughout the Old Testament. It is one of my favorite psalms. I have my kids memorize Psalm 2 because it's that important. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, the rulers, those have power and dominion and might they set themselves, see, they do it themselves as dominion by independence. And the rulers, they take counsel together against the Lord, Yahweh, and against the anointed, the Messiah. Sounds like the Tower of Babel, where the nations gathered and they set themselves against the Lord. And they say, let us burst their bonds. Whose bonds? The Yahweh's bonds and the anointed's bonds. We're going to find out what is this bond? What is this cord? Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The nations are the arrogant, the kings of the earth, dominion by independence from God. Like Adam tried to do, like Saul tried to do, like King Nebuchadnezzar tried to do, like Pastor Joel tries to do sometimes, and like Praise Church tries to do. We think we know better than God. How does arrogance express itself? How do you demonstrate that you think you know better than God? You put away his word. And you make your own standard for what's right and wrong. 
And that's the meaning here behind verse 3. Let us burst there, Yahweh, and anointed their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. What is this chain? What is this shackle for the arrogant? It is the word of God. Instead of God's word being a light unto our feet. Instead of God's word being more precious than silver and sweeter than honey. For unbelievers, God's word crimps their style. God's word restricts their freedom of choice. God's word is too archaic. God's word is too restrictive. I can't do whatever I want. I can't sleep with whomever I want. I can't spend my money the way I want. I can't live my life the way I want. So God's word for the arrogant is a chain. It's a bond. It's a cord that restricts us. That prevents us from finding joy. And the arrogant says, let's put away God's word. Let's burst their bonds apart. And cast away God's word from us. And let us determine for ourselves what to do. And what is it that man wants to do? Exalt yourself. Dominion. In response to man's attempt to dethrone God. If you ever read the psalm. What does God do? He laughs. He laughs. That's funny. That's funny, guys. Not only does the Lord laugh, but he holds them in derision. What does derision mean? Hatred. The Lord hates them. Ironically, in the arrogance attempt to exalt themselves by independence, from the cords of his word, it will lead to their humiliation. Instead of being lifted up, God will bring them low. God will embarrass the arrogant by showing them that the way to have dominion is through the Messiah, the anointed. And what does the Messiah do in order to have dominion over the nations? What does the anointed have to do in order that everything will be placed under his feet? How do you get dominion? The psalm says, ask God. He's got to ask. Which means you've got to trust the Lord. You don't got to figure stuff out by yourself. Ask the Lord. So in Psalm chapter 3, verse 6, in contrast to the kings of the earth, God says, I've set my king. Psalm chapter 2, right? I mean, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. My king on Zion, the city of David, my holy hill in Jerusalem, the temple, the city of David as well. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, which is an, an allusion to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, David, your son will be my son. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Allusion to Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. When Israel was adopted as a son. And here it is. What does it mean to be a son? You have dominion. How do you get dominion? Ask. Ask of me, Messiah. And I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break the arrogant 
with a rod of iron and dash him in pieces like a potter's vessel. One is the nations are conspiring. They're working hard. They're being diligent to try to exalt themselves. That's scene one. Scene two, the Lord laughs. The Lord picks his own king, not the kings of the earth. He has his own king, the Messiah. And the Messiah simply asks. And the Lord, what? Gives dominion. We don't earn dominion. We don't exalt ourselves. God exalts us. The irony is difficult to miss. That which the kings tried their hardest to achieve, they accomplished the exact opposite. Instead of being exalted, they are humiliated. If they only ask God in humility, God would grant them what they desire most, which is exaltation. Christmas then inaugurates the program of God to exalt the humble. Whereas the psalmist declares that God shall break the arrogant in their disobedience, Mary sings that God scatters the arrogant with the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 1, verse 51. He has done a mighty deed with his right hand and has scattered the arrogant. As, mean, as mentioned previously, this phrase, God has done a mighty deed with his right hand, alludes to, if you remember two weeks ago, the Exodus. This is Exodus language. God has done a mighty thing with his right hand. That's the Exodus. And God scattered the arrogant that's referring to Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. What Mary then is saying, with the birth of Jesus, God has performed the true exodus, the true deliverance, not from Egypt, but from sin and death. Not from Pharaoh, but from Satan. And God has done that through the birth of Jesus. That's why Mary sings with joy. Because the birth of Jesus inaugurates the second exodus promise. Now how will God deliver his people? How will God do this? By sending a king to be born in a palace? To have a crib made of gold and filled with diamonds? Is it to be surrounded by kings and dignitaries? Will he be welcomed with fanfare and trumpets from the palace big band? No. He was born in a barn because he was rejected at the end. He was born not on a luxurious crib, but on a manger, a trough, right? The feeding apparatus for horses. He wasn't clothed with fine linen, but he was swaddled with clothes. He was greeted not by kings and dignitaries, but with poor and lowly shepherds. And so the birth of Jesus lets us know that the pathway to exaltation is through humiliation. So Jesus then embodies exaltation through humiliation. He's born not in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. What is Bethlehem? You, O Bethlehem, are the least among 
Judah. You're the most insignificant town in Judah. But through you, Bethlehem, the Messiah will be born. He's born not in a palace, but in a barn. Born not in a crib, but in a manger. He's clothed not in fine linen, but in swaddling clothes. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. He was crowned not with precious stones, but with thorns. And so Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in my God, my Savior. Because this baby inside of me will bring the long promise of the Exodus. And the way in which this baby will bring this Exodus, this deliverance not just of Israel, but of humanity, is by humility, by dependence, by trusting and relying upon the Lord. Let us now close with the following challenge then. So the joy in Christmas is not receiving the gifts we coveted and we wrote down on our Christmas wish list. It's not having an Elfster and putting all your wish lists on your Elfster or your Amazon Christmas wish list. Share it to your family members. This is what I want. Thank you very much. That's not the joy in Christmas. And said the joy of Christmas is the vindication that God exalts the humble. Embodied in Jesus who was rejected by the inn at birth and rejected by man at death on the cross. Therefore, let us lay down our arrogance before the Lord Jesus so that he might highly exalt us and we can rejoice with Mary on this Christmas season. For some, this is foolishness. I don't get to determine what's right and wrong. The Word of God does. I don't get to say whom to have sex with, but God's Word does. I don't get to determine, determine my own ethics. I don't get to say whether abortion is right or wrong, but God does. I don't get to say whom to marry, but I got to submit to what the Word of God says. I don't have a say on how to spend my money, but I have to surrender everything unto the Lord. That's foolishness. And perhaps God's word is a cord and a bond that restricts your arrogance, your freedom. And maybe like the psalm, you want to say, let us break the bond of God's word apart. Let's cast away the word of God from my life. But you know what happens to the arrogant? The anointed crushes them. The Messiah scatters them and dashes them into pieces like the potter's vessel. But if you want to be wise, You've got to humble yourself. You've got to lay down your arrogance. Lay down your rebellion. You've got to come to the Lord. Lord, I confess. I've messed up my life. I've ruined my life. Living it the way I want. And I know this because I'm going to die. 
because the wages of sin is death. And death rules over me, and I feel it every day. And so on Christmas, God sends death. It's notice of eviction. Death, you will be kicked out. Because my son is here. And he will not sin like Adam. He will not sin like Israel. He will not sin like Pastor Joel. He will trust and obey the word of God perfectly. And his obedience will culminate at the cross. And on that cross, he bore our sins. He took our shame. He took God's wrath against us and placed it upon himself. And he died not because he sinned, but because he took my sin and your sin. And he vindicated to the world that his death was unjustified, unwarranted. He didn't die because he sinned. He died because he bore our sin. And he proved that by resurrecting from the dead. And he reigns forever. And death, for the first time, lost. Death could not hold Jesus. The dominion that Adam lost in the garden, Jesus reclaimed in victory. On Christmas Day, on Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. And the challenge for us is to lay down your rebellion. Lay down your pride. Place it at the feet of Jesus. And come and embrace him into your life. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that indeed you would help us to lay down our rebellion, our pride against you. That you would use us, Lord, to glorify your name to honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and worship the Lord.